Good morning. I want to welcome you to Committed to the Truth. It is a blessing and privilege to be back in your presence once again. I pray as we enter into another new week that wasn't promised that this message finds you blessed and it finds you growing, but also it finds you honoring one of the greatest gifts God has ever given humanity, and that's a, a mother. I want to say to our audience this morning, first and foremost to our mothers, Happy Mother's Day to you. I am honored to be here. I would not be here without a mother. Somebody need to say something. That is a blessing. Um, here's the thing. I know we have some, some traditional Mother's Day type messages that's normally preached and things of that nature around this time. I was led to go and read and study, and, I, and I'm using a passage of scripture that often is not referenced as a Mother's Day message. I'm going to be open with you, okay? Many of you know of the Proverbs 31, you know, because we talk about the Proverbs 31 woman and all this kind of stuff. Who can find a wife with her worth as far greater than rubies or depending on your translation, jewels, you know, right? And most of the time when people hear this message or that passage of scripture, it starts at verse 10 and it goes through verse 31, right? There's something that's often missed is the first verses from one through nine. One through nine literally is so beautiful and it's so poignant because it's two points of a godly mother teaching her son two things, how he should be as a man and what kind of woman he needs as a wife. And the only way he can have that kind of woman that he has to be this kind of man. Do you see what I'm saying? So she's teaching him this. And, and, and the thing is, is that when, he, when you read this, this, this passage of scripture, you don't realize that it is the son that is telling you these things. The mother is not there. He's regaling to us what the mother taught him, what she wrote on him. Now, here's the thing I got to tell you about human nature. If mama was not that way, it doesn't stick. So the only reason why he can give you such a great detail, because the details that which he's describing, he saw in his mother. Somebody should say something. So that's why I'm I was I'm thankful to for God sharing with me and showing me this beautiful mother's influence. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn with me to Proverbs 31, starting at the 10th verse, as everybody else does. Say amen when you have it, not so wait on me. Proverbs 31, starting at the 10th verse. Amen? Amen. And it reads this way. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. Verse 12. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Jump down with me to verse 27. It says, she looks well to the ways of her household. And does not eat the bread of idleness. Verse 28. Her children rise up and bless her and her husband also. And he praises her saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Verse 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Mighty and loving Father, once again, Master, this is your poor, weak, and unworthy servant coming humbly before your throne of grace and mercy. Just simply say thank you, Lord. Thanking you for this day. Thanking you for another opportunity to stand and be used in your service before going to the grave. But Father God, the hours come where your people have got themselves together. Once again, to hear from on high. So Master, your servant stands this morning. I pray for preaching power to fill me afresh in you with your Holy Spirit and that you would bless me to be able to rightly divide your word of truth before them. And Father God, you are our master and our savior and our redeemer. And we'll be forever careful to always remember to give you all the praise, the honor and the glory. And it's in your darling son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name we ask it all. And the body of Christ says together, amen? amen and amen. This morning's sermon title is called A Mother's Influence. A Mother's Influence. At the top of the outline, you'll find these beautiful words, a godly mother. It says a godly mother, her worth is far more than rubies. She is the bond in the heart of the home. Her role is multifaceted, but one stands out above all the others. It is that of the teacher of the good things of God. Somebody should say something. Yes. And so I just want to welcome you once again. I want to say to our mothers, happy Mother's Day to you. Today we celebrate one of the greatest gifts God has ever given to humanity, and that is mothers in itself. The first thing being Christ. And so there are so many wonderful books and songs and poems and letters written about mothers. Y'all realize that? And I believe in all of their splendor and greatness, 
These forms of illustration still fail to capture the true beauty of a godly mother. Now, here's the thing. We say godly because this is the attribute most profitable to motherhood. Somebody should say something because you are looking at me like I don't understand it. Let me break it down. It is not her looks, her knowledge, her social status, her wit, her friends or her wealth. But rather the graces that flow from God, the giver of every good and perfect gift. Somebody need to say something. OK, because see, if we were to take a poll of every child this morning and ask them which attributes of their mother was most treasured, I believe this attribute would be found to be the most precious because it is here that we find the graces of Christ, sacrifice, security, warmth, understanding, love, and compassion. Somebody say something. Then now you understand. Now y'all can smile again, right? You can smile now, right? Here's the deal. Now, before we jump into this excellent passage of scripture, I want to give you a little bit of its background. Look at verse one. It says this. The words of King Lemuel, the oracle or the speech which his mother taught him. Right now, we don't know really anything about King Lemuel other than that. He had a good Jewish mother. OK, and she gave him some really good advice because he was royal and because he was going to take a position of rulership. She told him some things that he really needed to know. This mother is riding on her son's heart. She had already earned the right, but now she is just further writing, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, because everything she's about to teach him, everything she's about to write upon him, he is now regaling to us because it's in him, not just on him. Y'all getting this? Okay. She said to him in verse three, Ooh, wee, this is going to get ugly. Do not give your strength to women. Now, some of y'all probably wondering what that means. I'm going to break it down for you. Do not engage yourself in sexual liaisons with other women. In other words, don't commit a fornication as a single man. She's telling her son who will be king these words. Keep your life pure. Do not give away your strength to women. See, I'm talking about a mother's influence. See, that's a woman telling her son about another woman. Are y'all listening? She's got the playbook. You see, those are the ways that destroys kings. She gave him some further good advice in verse four. She said, don't drink. Don't drink wine. Don't drink strong drink because it clouds your judgment. And she continued with this advice and she gave him some uh, to him in verse eight. She says, open your mouth for the mute. This is a mother's influence. She's teaching him how to be a man, a good man, a great man, not just a king. Amen. She says, in other words, speak for those people who can't speak for themselves. Those people who are oppressed, those people who cannot defend themselves, those people who are too small and insignificant to have a platform of self-defense. This is who you speak for. Isn't this beautiful? Most people have never heard this passage of the scripture because we always start at verse 10 and go from there. She's telling them you take up their cause. You take up the rights of the unfortunate. I'm talking about a mother's influence this morning. And then in verse nine, she told him, open your mouth and judge righteously and defend the rights of the afflicted in the needy. See, this is great advice coming from his Jewish mother to her son. Listen to it. Stay away from alcohol. Stay away from sexual immorality. Take care of hurting people. Defend those who can't defend themselves. Stand for, for the oppressed. Support the needy and deal justly with everyone. Somebody needs to say something. Because see, if we had that kind of rulership today, the world doesn't look the way it does right now. Amen. Good Lord. Because she was teaching him, this is how to be a good king, but this is also how to be a great man. She was more worried about him being a great man in God's eyes than a king. My Lord. Thank you. you see, and then most of all, and this is what occupied the length of her speech from verses 10 through 31. She tells him 
to find a good wife. Whoo! I'm talking about a mother's influence. See, in verse 10, his mother starts describing the model or the ideal woman. He, she says these words, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. She's telling him that she is priceless. And so you got to be a certain type of man to maintain a priceless type woman. Come on. Ooh, Lord. An excellent wife, verse 10 says, who can find her worth is far above jewels. And she goes on to describe this woman both physically, mentally, morally, and spiritually. In every dimension, the character of the excellence of, of this wife and this mother unfolds here right before your eyes. I'm talking about a mother's influence. She's telling him what kind of woman you need to have. She describes the ideal woman, this model woman, by looking at six features, and I'll read them to you briefly. Her character as a wife, you'll find those in verses 11 through 12 and verse 23. Her devotion as a homemaker, you'll find those in verses 13 through 19 and verses 21 to 24. Her, as a, her generosity as a neighbor, you'll find that in verse 20. Her influence as a teacher, you'll find that in verses 25 and 26. Her effectiveness as a mother, you'll find that in verses 27, 28, and 29. And her excellence as a saint, you'll find that in verses 30 to 31. You see, this kind of woman, according to Proverbs 19, verse uh, verse 14, God says is a gift from God. Oh, my Lord. So here's the deal. Too often when a selection is made of a woman or a wife, it is made for the wrong reasons. It's made based on her looks or her education, her personality, her likes and dislikes, her accomplishments or her style. Amen. Lights and walls. Rather than virtue, rather than character and the things that matter, we choose the things that instantly gratify. Come on. Hmm. But this woman has a value that is far above jewels. The word actually describes precious stones of any kind. Some versions translate it as rubies. Some translate it as pearls. Jewels is the best. It's just the generic word for precious stones. But the point being this is that this is a very, very valuable woman that is not easy to find. She's not common. Not oh, my Lord. Ooh -wee. Mm. See, I'm talking about a mother's influence. See, this morning we look at three aspects of this ideal woman in verses 11 through 12 and verses 27 through 31. And so it's in verse 11 she begins to describe this woman's character as a wife. Now, I want you to keep in mind, this is his mother teaching him what to look for in a woman. But only before she told him what kind of man he needs to be if he wants to attract this kind of woman. You don't have one without the other. I need to make that clear because all the time you want to go get the virtuous woman and you the hot dog and that don't work. Okay? She says, the heart of her husband trusts in her. And he will have no lack of gain. Now, y'all might think that's a strange thing to say because you go, well, well, naturally, right? No, no, not naturally. Mm -hmm. See, in the ancient world, these the things were a bit different, even in Judaism. Women were not looked upon as God had designed them to be looked upon, but grew to be seen as some sort of second class citizen. Right. And very often men built strong friendships with other men and maintained their wives only as servants. And in some cases, not even maintaining a particular devotion to intimacy with them. They had concubines for that. For their intimate acts. And so wives could be kept at a distance and treated very often as servants. And consequently, there wasn't always the devotion between the two that created trust. So as we read in some of the ancient documents, that it was somewhat common for husbands to Lock up all their valuables when they left. That's crazy, right? When they went away so their wives didn't take them. But one of the first things that we read in this whole passage is that the husband doesn't have to lock anything up because he trusts his wife. 
Y'all need to say something. Somebody should say something right there. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because it, I'm talking about a mother's influence. She's saying, you shouldn't be able to trust your spouse. Mm-hmm. Oh, Lord. This is mama teaching. And mama can't teach this to him if mama wasn't that kind of woman. And he would remember because you got to remember, he's telling us the story. Oh, my God. And the trust is well founded because she's not going to do anything to harm his personal gain. It's talking about the fact that there is an intimate relationship built on complete trust between the two. Somebody needs to say she's talking about a healthy relationship. Oh, Lord. The husband can go to work. He can go away and he can do whatever he needs to do with absolute confidence of her integrity. Her wisdom and her discretion in the use of his assets and and in the care of his interest. See, his comfort is her concern. His burdens are hers to relieve. See, he is at ease in absence because he knows that all is safe in her care. Come on, man. Somebody needs to say something. See, I know what he's talking about. I got one of those. Oh, my Lord, because she cares for him and he knows that. And love means she would never do anything that would cause him sorrow or suffering or pain or distress. Wouldn't you like to have one of them in your life? He is not suspicious. He's not worried. He's he's not jealous because she is absolutely trustworthy. You don't have to sweep the dough steps when you leave to see if there's new footprints. (laughs) My God. You see, this is a great foundation for a marriage. I'm talking about a mother's influence. Mama's teaching this. (sighs) By the way, this indicates and I think it is an important thing to mention that she is in charge of the domestic matters. She's running the pants. She's in charge of using and accounting for the resources of the home. He gives her, he is free to give her himself to his work, knowing that she will be a good steward of all that is entrusted to her. He ain't worried about it. She helps him to profit and not lose. Are y'all getting this? See, Because she seeks his good. And and, in verse 12, that's exactly what it says. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Can we say that about the women in our lives? Men. (laughs) This Jewish mother tells her son, you want a woman who always has your best interest in her heart. Not at the moment. who always seeks to build you up, who desires to make you every bit of the man that you can be in every area of life, not just in the areas that she wants. See, all the days of her life is spent devoted to the well-being of her husband in the good times, the bad times, the times of plenty, the times of little, the times of sadness, the times of happiness, in the sick times, and in the times of wellness as well. She's always there because her love for him is that deep and that rich. Her love is ever and always devoted to the success of her husband. She is concerned about the highest spiritual principles. She never fluctuates. She seeks the very best and the noblest for the man who is her husband. Now, you got to ask yourself, why is this mama telling them to get a woman like this? Because it takes that kind of woman to maintain the kind of man she told her son to be. This is, there's a purpose. Yes, it does. See, Sarah served Abraham according to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, and called him Lord. Sarah was committed to him. Now, I'm talking about a mother's influence. Y'all work with me. She reveals her virtue by her consistent service on his behalf. Her love is so deep that it is a 
And it has a purity and a power and a devotion that never changes. In her life, his successes, his comfort, his reputation, his joy is her delight. Amen. To live for him is her constant happiness. And a footnote at this point. That means that when necessary, because his highest good is her greatest desire. Now, y'all might want to get your pens and paper ready, okay? She will confront his sins and his weaknesses. Amen. Do y'all get that? I'm going to say that again for you. Mm -hmm. This means that when necessary, because his highest good is her greatest desire, she will confront his sins and his weaknesses, and lovingly she will be a conscience unto him. She will be necessarily the voice of God. Somebody need to say something because, see, we're very good at giving everything we have into a woman and believing everything she says. We'll leave mama, daddy, sister, brother because of this woman. But if you got the right woman when she's speaking to you and she sees you going astray, she's going to be the voice of God when you won't even listen to him. My Lord. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Because you see, and she does all this never unkind, always submissive, but eager to be sure that her husband walks with God. That's part of desiring him to be everything he should be. My God. Y'all watch out. This is a good word. And by the way, this is the essence of what Titus chapter 2 verse 4 says. When it tells the young women to love their husbands, that's what it means. It doesn't mean to walk around gaga all over the guy. Oh, I love him. He's so slow. You know. It doesn't mean to be some kind of emotion. It means that when you love somebody, you seek his best interest. Amen. You seek that, would, that he would be the very... Every bit of the man that God would want him to be, that he would be as much as he could be spiritually. This is what you mean when you love him. That he would be all that God would have him to be. And as much as he could be professionally in every way. To seek that, he would be the best father. To seek that, he would be the best friend. To seek that, he would be the best worker. To seek that, he would be the best husband. Oh, my God. And thus this woman advances her husband's respect. Jump down with me to verse 23. It says this. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. The point is, he is known as her husband. And his reputation is known far and wide because of her. He is known by everybody. Let me give you the backstory real quick. What happened in the ancient times was there was gates in the cities. There would be a sort of a platform area or a patio area where the elders of the city would gather together every day and they would indulge and judge the matters that came up in the city. It was sort of like an open court where hearings were made with regards to the issues of the time. So if you two had issues, y'all would bring it to the elders of the gate, and the elders of the gate would listen to your side and his side, and all of a sudden when it was all said and done, they'd pass a judgment, right? And so this is where business was carried out, and the elders of the city, the mature men of the city, sat in that place and rendered judgment. So this is what she's talking about when he speaks of it, about it. He's known at the gates. Great reputation, right? The point being that this man has a great reputation among the leaders of the city. It is a reputation basically built by his wife. Do you understand that? If you've got a woman in your life that can only speak ugly of you, your reputation is going to be boo-boo and she's boo-boo with you. Just want to make sure you know. It is a reputation basically built by his wife. She is so faithful to the duties of her love to him that he is free to be every bit the man that he can be. And so he develops a tremendous reputation. That reputation is undergirded by her. He didn't do it by himself. He's not a great man alone. You've always heard behind every great man is a great woman. But we don't believe that. But it's true. 
Biblically, he's telling you. Because she's doing everything to make him everything he should be for God. Not for what she wants. She's contributing to his spiritual development. She's contributing to the clarity with which he sees the issues of life. She's helping to make sure he's gauging the things real and not lofty. She's granting him the wisdom that she gains from the knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's word. Somebody to say something. This is the kind of woman his mother is telling him you need to have in your life. I'm talking about a mother's influence this morning. Because, see, she serves him. She cares for the things behind the scenes so he's free to be everything that God would have him to be in front of everybody else and for the community. So he is known as a man of great nobility and great respect because of the contributions that she has made selflessly to him. And also, you can be sure that she has done everything she can as well verbally to build up his reputation. I got one of those. <sighs> and never do anything to tear it down. She gains nothing by tearing down her husband's reputation. Absolutely nothing. If people have a diminished respect for him, then they will have a diminished respect for her as well. First of all, because she speaks evil of her husband, and secondly, because he chose someone inadequate to help him to become all that he could be. Ooh, Lord, that hurts. But it's true. And so now, if you would just jump down and look with me at verses 27 to 28, we see her effectiveness as a mother. Listen to what it says. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness, verse 28, her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her seeing. So it starts out this way. She exercises, according to verse 27, careful surveillance over everything. She manages the children and she manages the household and she is not lazy. I'm talking about the, a mother's influence this morning. Don't get you a lazy woman, son. Yes, sir. <laughs> she is not eating the product of laziness, but the bread of a loving hard work. And then the real satisfaction comes from her. It comes from the people she loves the most. She's given everything to them. And what does she get back in return? They rise up and they bless her. And they praise her. Amen. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Mothers, wouldn't it be great to have your children come in and praise you? Bless you. Speak well of you. Eulogize you positively while you're still breathing. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. They reverence her, literally. They honor her. They told her and they hold her in high esteem. And even her husband, because he, she has set aside her own comfort for his, she receives from him the supreme blessing after all the years of life. He loves her more than he's ever loved her because he now understands her character better than he ever understood it. I am who I am because of her. What's not to praise? What's not to honor? You get it? See, he loves her more than he's ever loved her because he now understands her character better than he ever understood it. And then in verse 29, the husband shares, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Meaning I've met a lot of women and some pretty wonderful ones, but I wouldn't trade you for any of them. And as she becomes older, her children grow and they have their own children and they endeavor then to raise them as they were raised by her. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm talking about a mother's influence. She is constantly before their eyes, her tenderness, her guidance, her wise counsel, her loving discipline, her holy example, her, her hard work, and her unselfish giving. All of these things never cease to fill the memories of her children. She's wrote them on them because that was what was before them, and that's what wrote upon them as to what they should become. Amen. Wow. That's how righteousness is passed from one generation to the next. 
And it's in verse, as we're closing, and it's in verses 30 to 31 that we see her excellence as a saint. It says, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Do y'all understand that this is a simple point? Look past the superficial is what it's teaching. Charm in the Hebrew means gracefulness of form. It talks about her shape. Many of us have fallen due to bad shapes. <laughs> Beauty has to do with the face. That it is deceitful. Because it can all look good and really cover up a wicked and bad heart. But I got a bad one on my own. But she's the devil on the inside. Mama's telling him what kind of woman to have. So he can be the kind of man she told him to be. But a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. So Lemuel's mother says, find a woman who fears the Lord. Therein is the beginning of wisdom. She will be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gate. Somebody should say something. What are the products of her hands? All the good she's done to others. It will now come back to her. All the sacrifices that she's made for her life for others. They will be hers for the rest of her life. Everything she did in private will come back in public as they praise her in the gates in the middle of town. She will be famous for her godly womanhood. Not how she twerked. You get it? Not how she made it. None of that. She'll be famous for her godly womanhood. That's her reward. So as we close, I'm just going to say this. Mothers, I'm talking about a mother's influence. There's not a life on this earth that didn't come through the body of a woman that became a mother. Not one. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mothers, your job to shape and mold a nation. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has always been that. Mm -hmm. Go back to the garden when Eve fell. Mm -hmm. The way that she would be able to regain her position was children, shaping them to honor God. A mother's influence, do not discredit it or discount it. Because it shapes not just what's in your home, but it shapes what's in your community. It not only shapes what's in your community, but it shapes what's in your nation. It not just shapes what's in your nation, but it also shapes what's in the world. With that being said, let us pray. God, I thank you for another beautiful time in your word, Master. I pray, Father, that all that was shared here this morning was accepted in thy sight. God, I thank you for every mother here and every mother that's online that's listening. God, I pray that you would just give these beautiful women to stay an extra anointing of your dunamis, your power, your grace, your mercy, your strength, your encouragement, your hope, all the things that they pour out into everyone that they touch. Replenish them, refill them, restore them, encamp your angels around them, cherish them, protect them, for we need godly mothers today more than we've ever needed anything else. And so even now, Father God, as we prepare our hearts and minds to leave this place but never your sight, God, I pray that you would go before us, lead us and guide us, keep us in perfect peace 
until we should come together again. And we ask these blessings, Father, in your darling Son, Christ Jesus, mighty and holy name. And the body of Christ says together, amen? amen and amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Like and share. See you next week. Drop a comment. Mothers, happy Mother's Day to you. Take care. Thank you.